Okay, Sophie and Emily, lovely to see you. Um, we're going to be talking about Charles Spencer's conversation with me, which was a hard lesson. It was a hard book to read, so painful. And I'd love to know what your kind of responses are. So incredibly courageous and open about these horrendous experiences. And I think when someone has experienced that much abuse and violence, it's it's hard to imagine. Like it, it's it's sort of almost feels like a film when you're listening to him. It kind of like it's not something you know that I have ever experienced anything like. So it's almost like a sort of a distance. And I think that one of the things that can sometimes happen when children have experienced abuse, whether that's physical, sexual neglect, is is that it's sometimes they're not believed because we don't want to believe that it's like it's it's unbearable to imagine that these things are true so i think particularly with sexual abuse we sort of i think it can happen that it's downplayed or oh no it's probably just your cousin messing around or the reality of the truth that it that it could have happened and it could have happened to your child is too much to bear and so we sort of shut it down which is obviously the opposite of what we need to do in that situation and also so often children don't even disclose or don't even disclose as adults because they know how much people don't want to hear it or it will completely I have had many clients who haven't disclosed to other family members because it will completely alter the story of their whole family their relationships to that person you know if it's a familiar person who's they all knew it's such a devastating part of abuse, particularly sexual abuse, is the shame element and the kind of that keeps it up that much more locked up in secrecy, which, as you spoke about with him, does so I much agree. of the damage. I was just going to say, and I think the thing that's very complicated about child sexual abuse mm. is that the meaning of it really changes as you get older. So at the time, I think often children don't necessarily. They know that this doesn't feel right. There's a feeling of shame. They don't know what to do. But also that meaning changes as they get older and are more aware of like, that should never have happened. That was really, really wrong. And I think the other complicated part is that often you can experience a bodily arousal. So you can have a response to sexual abuse that's associated with pleasure because your body is responding to sexual contact. And then I think it could feel like my body betrayed me. My body had this reaction. And I think as a child, that's also very, very a confusing, complicated feeling. So I think there's just so much complexity and darkness that comes with child sexual abuse that I thought Charles really spoke to so eloquently. When I, I've worked with many people who've been, and you know, there's all kinds of abuse, like you said, psychological neglect, physical and, and sexual. And Charles had all of them, the sort of physical threat of danger as well of being beaten in the place where he's also sexually abused, I think adds a kind of level of danger and threat that is uh, kind of unbearable to even think about. But when I've worked with people who've been sexually abused and physically abused, and often the two go together and neglect, they often are combined. There's a feeling like the shame, and because it's never been disclosed, and with the way the abuser has spoken to them, there's this sense that there's something wrong with them and that they're silenced um, by the abuser and that they asked for it, that it was their fault, and that they're fundamentally flawed in some way. And if they disclose it, then they will be kind of exiled even more than they already internally exile themselves. And I think the uh, long-term effect of that is this disgust and loathing for themselves where they can't be, be close to themselves. There's no sense of connection with themselves which also, of course, means they can't be close to another and they can't have intimacy. So they can may well have sex and relationships. They're not from a place of safety. And for relationships to thrive and us to be open and fully ourselves, 
to reveal our, our true self, as it were, and we need to feel safe. And if you have that internal permanent sense of threat, you, you never trust enough to open yourself and to trust another. All of that is, is so true in my experience as well. But I would also add on to that, that as a result, often people who've had a history of childhood sexual abuse can have had many, many sexual partners, partly because either they struggle to have long-term relationships or they put themselves in vulnerable, risky relationships with situations, sexual situations. Their boundaries have been violated and violated at a time that they were not even able to make sense of what was happening. And therefore, it's often hard to find safe, risky and, and appropriate boundaries in later life. But I think this can also add to feelings of shame because they can often then end up in more risky situations and multiple partners Blame that can themselves. add to the narrative mm -hmm. in their head that somehow it's their fault or they're, they're a shameful person. It, I think people assume sometimes that if you've had a history of childhood sexual abuse, that might mean that you then avoid sex which can happen for some people as well, but it can also look like the opposite, which is less, I think, less people are less aware of. Right. And I, I think that definitely I worked for a long time with children who experienced lots of different forms of abuse. And I think safety is such, is such an essential component. So I think safety in the context of a child that's experienced abuse is really about relational safety. It's about feeling safe with the people who are looking after you, which is obviously the opposite to what Charles experienced. And I think that if you have a child that has experienced abuse, it doesn't necessarily mean a life of pain and unhealthy relationships like, you know, it's doomed. But I think that to get support, particularly if you have young children, it really needs to be relational intervention. So particularly if you have children that are five and under, the way to rebuild that sense of safety is through the relationship. And there are various different therapeutic interventions. The one that I am trained in is called child parent psychotherapy. But that is a intervention where you're repairing through the safety of the relationship. So it's not the child and the therapist. So you almost model it, you live it through the relationship, as it were. So you do lots of different things, but the therapist is essentially facilitating making sense of this abuse or this trauma using the relationship so that it's really the parent or the caregiver that's providing the safety and the therapist is kind of holding that and facilitating that. If, if you do have a child or you work with children that have experienced trauma or abuse, and there is a fantastic website called the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which is quite a mouthful, that has a lot of resources. And I think, you know, the other part of that is also thinking about protective factors as well. You know, I think you can start, one of the things Charles mentioned was, you know, protect your children, guard your children. And obviously he's had this, you know, in his life, abuse was such a huge part of it. I think for most of us, we sort of assume that won't happen to our children and hopefully it, it won't. But if we're sort of thinking about protection, not in a way that will make your child anxious, like you've got to be on guard for danger, but if you just <laughs> teach them things around consent, which you can really teach toddlers. You can teach toddlers about expressing if they don't like something the way that somebody touches them and there's lots of really great books about this as well that just in a very simple age appropriate way talk about they're like social stories essentially so saying when is it okay for somebody to see your private parts when is it not okay what should you do if somebody makes you feel uncomfortable in your body what should you do and i think it's very helpful to have those conversations from really really early like I think you can teach it's natural yeah it's natural and, and things that you can do as parents like to do with boundaries and bodily autonomy like you know I think we have a sort of cultural tradition of you know you should give somebody a hug or you know this is your grandma you should give them a hug <laughs> and actually allowing your child to make that decision thinking of a different way that you could greet somebody if a hug doesn't feel right to you so I you know I think there are things that you can do that can kind of be a protective factor. 
one of the things I thought it was worth sort of mentioning was about class. As you know, Charles says he's from a very privileged background. In fact, the three of us are from a very privileged background. And I think that sometimes there's a misconception that abuse and neglect is something that mainly happens in poverty or in deprivation. When in fact, the reality is that anyone from any background can experience abuse of all kinds. And it's, and it's equally devastating. And I sometimes think that one of the sort of damages that our class system can do is it blocks our ability to connect across the divide to each other's pain because there is understandably a lot of strong emotions and pain and legacy around these things but it, it's actually one of those things that I've worked with people from all different backgrounds who've had very traumatic histories and that can sometimes get clouded over by by the sort of class system. Also it's sort of made invisible because you see the beautiful house or the title mm. or the kind of grandness and it means that you just don't see the actual neglect and the actual emotional poverty and destitution that is within the kind of gilded grandeur. And actually that kind of institutional abuse that exists in, has existed in boarding schools and actually reminded me a lot of when I was working in Ireland of clients who experienced abuse at the hands of the church also often in schools and within church communities is it's that thing of absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, it's having such total control over a, both vulnerable children or people, but also a system that's extremely powerful where people are afraid to challenge it, where the culture and the social pressure, you know, in, within the upper classes to send your children to boarding school in order to belong, to be part of the club, as well as the sort of belief in the upper, you know, the sort of stiff upper lip that, that he talked about. Uh and I worked with clients in Ireland who parents knew what was happening to them and they were too terrified from the consequences of them and their entire family to do Being anything ostracized. about it wow. because you'd be ostracised. Cool. So I think there is a particular, it's not saying it's better or worse, <laughs> sort of comparative thing, but there is particular factors in institutional abuse like this that are different to familial abuse. Yeah. I think that's such an interesting point, Sophie, because one of the things that I was thinking as I was listening, and like the, in sort of terms of institutional abuse versus sort of interpersonal abuse on a much more intimate relationship, because there was a part, Mum, where you sort of said she was evil or something, mm. and Charles said she did evil things. Yeah. And I thought that that was such a profound distinction to make because a lot of my working life I've worked with children and teens that have experienced abuse and some of that has meant also working with the person who perpetrated the abuse with that child or caregiver and I think my personal belief is that there aren't evil people that my experience was that these parents or caregivers had experienced horrendous horrendous things themselves and I think that there is a way, at least from an outsider perspective, that you can have compassion for both. The perpetrator and the victim. Mm -hmm. mm. I do think you can. And it's very common that the, the perpetrator is also a victim. Isn't it? Exactly. And I'm just wondering what difference the sort of institution makes to that. Maybe it just sort of justifies it more from the perpetrator's perspective or you're sort of part of the system but I hadn't sort of thought of it through that lens so much. I sort of more thought of it through the individual lens. There's so much to say, and we, we can't kind of cover it all, but I was thinking about boarding school, and I went to boarding school, and I sent you to boarding school, and in retrospect, I, I wish I hadn't sent you to boarding school, and I was just wanting to acknowledge that, you know, I was a therapist by the time I sent to boarding school so I I did know about child development so I was just thinking from my perspective I don't know if it's a habit or an expectation or a norm is so powerful that it becomes your norm and you do it even 
I did actually think it would do you harm. I, I liked body school, so I, I would never have done it if I thought it did you harm. But you know, I was so influenced by my own experience and my own background, I guess, that, that, that this was the right thing for you. Maybe. I, I, I mean, I think my, my memory of that is that you're actually quite conflicted about it. That yeah. it wasn't that you just did it because that's what your parents did. You know, I think that was a factor. But it, I think you did actually sort of think it through of like, oh, like, I'm not sure. Maybe I should. Maybe I shouldn't. And eventually. And also you were taking into account what we said we wanted. So I, I wouldn't paint you as like, <laughs> you're just like, oh, well, that's what people do. They just send their children to boarding school. So I will. I think there was. I remember being conflicted, but I still did it. <laughs> yeah. It's about a bit generational. I mean. As well, yeah. I think. Yeah. I mean, you'd more. never do it, would you? Thank God. I would n- no. <laughs> <laughs> Not that's a no. I would say that's a no from both of us. <laughs> but on that point, was sort of my the really was one of my final thoughts, and I was thinking about sort of healing the intergenerational damage, right? Because this is this is wounds that were passed Systemic, down, yeah, transgenerational to, to him and intergenerational trauma, and. I was thinking about a very different episode in terms of background, which was Azaria Hope, who also herself experienced a lot of trauma and then her children got taken into care if listeners have listened to that episode. And just the power of acknowledging, and this isn't about Charles, this is in in a general, if you're someone who knows that that you have had experience a very difficult background and some of that you've got really wrong with your own children, that actually is a huge power in just a basic acknowledgement to your children that that is the case. It might be very hard to go into the ins and outs if you haven't processed it a lot in therapy. But I know many a client who said to me, I wish they would just acknowledge it and say, I'm aware I got that wrong. I'm really sorry. And even if the actual full conversation, the other thing is to think of letters, if actually speaking or talking to a child or relative is too hard or hard to do live, to write a letter saying to acknowledge Mm -hmm. I'm really sorry I got that wrong. I didn't realise or I did realise, but I was stuck and blocked. It can I be think that could be a very healing powerfully of, healing yeah. for the next generation. And I think the other part of that is there's a lot of what you need if you've experienced trauma, particularly if as a child, is a narrative. And I think you, that if you are a caregiver that can help provide that narrative, then that can be very helpful in being able to begin to differentiate between the then and the now because trauma kind of takes away the then and the now. It's the then is constantly in the the now. Mm -hmm. And the more that you kind of have a narrative around what happened, the more you can differentiate between the then and the now. That's really brilliant. And just to end on recovery and that it never takes away the horror of what happened or the damage that's been caused for anyone listening who's been a victim of abuse. But that that there is a way of living with it and recovering from lots of different types of treatment, whether it's EMDR, whether it's the Hoffman process, whether it's therapy, whether it's groups, so many different ways. But I think the first step is acknowledging it and having it validated and and in some way disclosing and then from there as Emily talked about you can begin to find your narrative and as you find your narrative you can begin to change your narrative so that you... and, and make sure that you go to a therapist that is experienced in trauma so trauma informed specifically so thank you both I mean it was such a powerful episode so I'm so grateful for Charles for being so courageous and, and brave and being so open um And thank you for your insights. And thank you to everyone that listens to our podcast. And if this is an episode that you would like to share with others, do please share it, do rate and subscribe to the podcast so we can be found by others. If you want to sign up for our newsletter, it's on Substack. And thank you for listening to us.